Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning everybody, we were looking at how to analyze a non-normal system and uh, we wanted to, uh, so we, we showed that thermo system is non-normal and we show that uh, uh, there is transient growth and we also showed that uh, transient growth uh, does play a role in getting the triggering oscillation, so the subcritical uh, transition to instability and uh, we were looking at uh, how to characterize this transient growth, so we came up with this. Uh, parameter called uh, G which is norm of the uh, state vectors or, or uh, uh, at some time t divided by the norm at time t equal to 0 which we showed that this is equal to the norm of the evolution operator then we said we will uh, maximize this for uh, all initial conditions and then we maximize it for all times and uh, then we get the maximum growth factors are there any questions. Actually, I didn't read this concept, but the norm of the vector. Okay, so we will uh, redo this uh, this question, uh, redo this issue. So uh, let's start from the differential equation d chi by dt. The uh, chi is the state variables or the vector containing the state variables, uh, and you have evolution operator d chi by dt plus l chi is zero. And this is if chi was just a number, then you can integrate it the way you. Uh, the way you integrate a number for example So this is what you would do if you are just one, uh, one, one variable that is if it was a scalar but you can do the same with a matrix and we saw what is the meaning of matrix exponential how to calculate matrix exponential etc yesterday. So now uh, we say chi of t is e power minus lt chi naught and we need the norm of this e power minus lt. Now uh, uh, see we know that the norm of a vector you know what is the norm how do you define a norm. Yeah, so it is so let me get to that slide one second. Uh, so we if you had a vector you square them all and then you get the norm. Now uh, the scaling by k1 it is like uh, you know if you it is just the right amount of scaling for example uh, you can use. Uh, in one if you have x y z and in one direction you have centimeter another another place you have meter then if you square and add it would not be right everywhere you have to have um, meter meter then only it will make physical sense. So it is something like that some scaling to make physical sense now the question is uh, so this is okay when you have a vector but what happens when you have a matrix now who said square the mat and you get the norm. I mean you said this definition was okay in the beginning just before the class started uh, that square them all and you get the norm and that was okay with you. So who, who told you that this is okay or who, who came up with this definition of norm? So who defined it? Huh? Somebody human being defined it and we define things as that uh, so we, uh, in, in maths we come up with things and then we try to interpret real life situation with these things. For example, you say 1 into 5 is 5, so that means if you have 5 chocolates, uh, you give 1 kid 1 on uh, chocolate and then the 5 kids they all got 5 chocolate. So you set up this uh, maths and then you see if you can um, uh, apply it to physical. Now you say minus 1 into 5 is minus 5, now how you, uh, so this is an abstract concept, no one, uh, uh, I mean you cannot just prove this, you, it, it is just a given thing. You can interpret it as you owe me 5 rupee, he owes me 5 rupee like that 5 people owe me minus, minus, uh, 1 rupee 
So then I call each person owes me minus one rupee. Five times that I have to get five rupee. I have to get I put minus five. So you define something. It may be useful or useless. And maths people, you see, they do lots and lots of things. Only a small fraction of it we use. So uh, they do also don't know. And what they're doing, see, what we are doing is what they did hundred years or two hundred years back. And what they are doing now, we won't touch till 2000, uh, 2200 or 2300. And that's the way it is. And, and uh, physicists are one step ahead. What physicists do 50 or 70 years before, engineers are doing now. I mean, and mathematicians are way ahead. But most of the things mathematicians do will be useless. Some will be useful, which the physicists will take. Engineers will wait till the physicists take the subject to some level. Then they will take it and start making things. So that's the way it is. So the norm was defined that way. Okay, and you could have defined norm in some other way, and there are other ways of defining norms. What are some other ways of defining norm? Actually, you can also define norms as the maximum value of the set or something. That's also huh? sorry, a supreme norm. You can define it whichever way. So you define something which is useful. Uh, just to give you an example. Now you have two players, yesterday we saw Suresh Raina playing, I saw it actually, for a long time I saw a cricket match in the night uh, and we, he replaced Yusuf Patar. Apparently both have same averages, so what they wanted was, they were sure that a lot of wickets will fall and at that time they wanted some guy to stay till the end, so that was the objective. So if you look at Suresh Raina's average and Yusuf Patan's average, they are same. But standard deviation is very high for Yusuf Patan, he will someday kill everybody and many other days get killed himself. Raina is kind of a steady guy, so, so the average itself as a norm alone did not help in making a decision. In under that circumstances you need some guy who is not only has a decent average but standard deviation is also low so that he will make the average always, okay. So uh, th that is the idea. Now if we did not care about this situation and we had no problem if the, if the uh, middle order batted well and the lower middle order came and all we had to do was the hit then we need a guy with a high standard deviation because a guy with a low standard deviation he may not attempt these things, okay. So uh, you see, the, so why did uh, uh, the standard deviation matter, I mean uh, because it, the circumstances demanded it. So what you need, you have to figure out what it is and use it and there are lots of norms available in um, maths, okay. So we are taking two norm for some reason and you can imagine why also because like um, square of something, so you can you, you can already see in advance you have p prime squared plus u prime squared, so that is our hidden agenda, we want to get something similar to that if at all possible, okay. So now the question comes, what is the uh, norm of this exponential operator, so we again look at let us say take the books of linear algebra, search through everything, yes there is a two norm for that also, which is defined as the principal singular value and so it, it does not makes sense because singular value is a uh, abstract thing, principal singular value is some other abstract thing and norm is another abstract thing. So we have to, uh, of course mathematicians develop abstract things, it is our job to find the right abstract thing and put it in a physical thing. So now what we need is, what we, we, we can see from the numerical simulations and all the stories that I told earlier that you can have eigenvectors decaying but some direction you can grow. So growth has to be measured in some energy norm, okay. So in which case here we say something like p prime squared plus u prime squared weighted, okay. So now that is like the two norm of the vector space. Now so if you take two norm on this side, you have to take two norm on the other side also. So now what we need is some machinery which will find those directions and its amplifications. So that is the idea and it exists as singular value. Now if you understand the meaning which I will go through again slowly, then you will know why we choose principal singular value, okay, as the uh, uh, or why we why we chose no, uh, two norm or why this uh, two norm is appropriate and, and so on. So uh, this part you understood I guess that sing, uh, singular value decomposition. Okay, now uh, there are lots of decomposition in matrix algebra. Can you come up with some names? There are lot of decompositions in linear algebra. Huh? LU decomposition, QR decomposition, well, SVD singular value decomposition, Eigen value decomposition. There are lots of decomposition. We have to pick what is necessary. Okay. So when you look at uh, science, now I say this is what is the th done thing done. 
uh, when you see how this was discovered, we tried lot of things and this is what works and the guys before me tried everything and I am sure they would have tried 100 things, 99 failed, 1 worked and then we picked up, that is that's my experience uh, and, and I was trying to, so I to be honest very, uh, I was trying to look at this and I was really uh, bogged down by this problem how to find the maxima and a friend of mine said that in fluid mechanics they use SVD to characterize and uh, then I was trying to understand the meaning of SVD and, and so on because you, they can do whatever they want but if you are able to interpret that in our circumstance, uh, it, it looks good. So in reality, this is not the line of thought that happened when this ideas came, it is all, but now everything is done, now everything is neatly presented, but that is not the way uh, things, were, things are developed. For example, in a movie when it, when it is shot, they do not shoot in the order of the scenes, sometimes maybe the last scene will be the first time that is shot, in between scenes may be the shot next, first scene may be shot last, but in the end you edit and put it. So that is the way finally it is presented, so that the person who hears it makes sense but that is probably not the way the guy who made it came up with, okay. So that is some of the difficulty here. So we have this decomposition where you take any matrix A and, and I said you can have many decomposition, here you say U sigma V transpose, U is a unitary matrix, sigma is a matrix with non-negative numbers on the diagonals and um, zeros of the uh, diagonal and uh, V transpose is the transpose of V and U and V are both uh, unitary uh, matrices, okay. So now we do SVD of our evolution operator. So we have d chi by dt plus L chi is 0 and uh, chi is this state vectors uh, eta and eta dots and uh, this is the analytical solution except that e power minus LT involves matrix exponential. So we do SVD of this evolution operator because th th that is what we are concerned with. Huh? <coughs> Vector we know how to do SVD right, I mean uh, to, to, to get the norm because you have chi naught and chi, we know the norm, we want to get the norm of this. So we write chi t as u sigma v transpose, okay, uh, I mean we are doing, let us see what happens. And now uh, uh, if the physical meaning of this is since v transpose it is a unitary uh, matrix, so v transpose chi naught is actually resolving the initial condition vector into orthonormal basis of input vectors. So just like you have a um, um, vector and you can write it as Ax plus, uh, I mean Ai plus Bj plus uh, 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 Ck or you can write some capital A times Er plus capital B times E theta plus uh, some other ti thing times E phi. So similarly, we have this basis, we use this V transpose as a basis and it is resolving the initial condition along those basis and they are uh, ortho orthonormal, okay, so that is the idea. And now uh, u multiplied by sigma v transpose chi naught, this represents the out, output normal as a linear superposition of components along the orthonormal basis. But the thing is you are having another basis, so the original may, basis may be like this but this could be rotated or something, okay. So there is no guarantee that you will follow the same basis. Now uh, to understand the physical meaning, uh, so the eigen, uh, so, uh, the singular vector, uh, there are several vectors in the matrix, so we will have to uh, look at that. So easy way to look at it is we multiply e power minus LT by V from the right side. Now why do I do this? You can do anything you want, whatever you do, uh, if it returns some results then it is good, many things will not return the results. Now uh, for example when I was a kid I was always wondering why do people bowl outside the off stump, if they want to strike the wicket you should bowl straight, but later I understood that uh, if you ball outside the uh, off stem, uh, people will uh, try to take a swing at it and then you will get a catch and you will be out, so that is the objective. So uh, now if you ball outside the off stem and the guy does not care, he will just uh, like our uh, walls of Indian cricket, Rahul Dravid just lift the bat up and then you just wasted a delivery, okay, uh, so something like that. <coughs> so you can do anything, whether it is useful then it is oh yes, again wonderful, a brilliant idea and all that, so uh, but often. Um, these things are, they just do it not without and then things work and then you construct why it is done, okay, to be very honest about it. So evolution operator is e power minus LT and we, let us see it is acts on the um, uh, most sensitive input condition. Huh? <coughs> so this will give sigma 1 which is the maximum possible gain multiplied by u1. Now the e power LT can not only act on v1 but can act on v2, v3, v4, v5, v10. Uh, 
Uh, now why there are these columns because we are discretized so the size of the system is now dependent on how many modes you have. So you will have that many directions okay. So you have you do not have infinite number of initial conditions you have finite number of combination determined by the dimension of the system that is we if you take 10 Galerkin modes you will have um, 10 times 10, uh, 2 20, uh, uh, 20 vectors will be there okay. So uh, e power lt acts on one of these things and you will get um, the output u and v are they are unitary. So, sigma 1 will choose show the amplification okay. So, uh, to see it in uh, this matrix form so a if it acts on v 1 you will get u 1 so v 1 is the right or left here right singular vector or left singular vector just look at your notes or right singular vector. So, the evolution operator acts on the or any operator acts on the right singular vector you will get another basis function which is u1 which is multiplied by a number. Now, if it is acting on some vector here let us say you will get uh, another vector here somewhere here with some other number here okay. So, you can do anything we are interested in the maximum uh, amplification see generally in instability we are worried about the damage how much it can grow. So, if you know the maximum damage you know okay this is like a bound in anything that occur will be below this. So, here our attempt is to uh, uh, pick the maximum growth okay. So, if you are <coughs> if you replace this um, a with the evolution operator that is e power lt um, here uh, it is I mean in, in our norm uh, this are slide from Peter Schmidt uh, I mean our l was minus of this okay. Uh, <coughs> so, this operates on v 1 you will get u 1 and uh, times the sigma which is the norm of this okay. Now, uh, so you have optimum initial condition and uh, uh, you you uh, this is uh, wrong actually it is a right uh, a right singular vector and uh, this is uh, you you get it amplified and you get the uh, uh, output direction okay is it clear. So, uh, uh, principal singular value shows the maximum energy amplification and the corresponding right singular vector shows the most sensitive initial condition. Uh, so, I, I, it, now it is clear I do not have to yeah, you had a question. Yeah. Yeah. We can diagonal it in, but uh, the thing is uh, the energy is not uh, so you have um, several eigenvectors uh, you are asking why it evolves independently or something. Yeah, I think, but the normal, normal, normal can be a general case, it cannot be diagonal. Any matrix can be diagonal. Hmm? If you do eigenvalue decomposition, yeah, but that is only if you have the eigenvalue decomposition, you can you, you can do eigenvalue decomposition for any matrix. You can have an eigen basis for the vector You can have eigen basis it won't be orthogonal. So, the problem is that so if you have several eigen eigen vectors then each of them evolves as sorry uh, e power lambda sigma I equal to 1 to n. So, each e power lambda 1 t evolves one way e power lambda 2 evolves another way e power lambda 3 evolves another way and that does not e power lambda 1 t how it evolves does not depend on e power lambda 2 t. But the problem is you cannot take the energy of the modes and add up and you will not get the energy of the system. So, that is the only problem. That is okay. So, still eigen, eigen no, no, I, I eigen vectors are independent. No, but they, they, they will be independent, but, but they will have a dot product, will not be 0. Yeah, but you need not have n linearly independent. I mean, if they are uh, uh, repeating, 
Yeah. So here you uh, okay. If you don't repeat, this okay. But the problem is you can have modes, but the sum of the energy of the modes is not equal to the energy system. That is the only problem. So in that sense, they are. Uh, so you, if you have energy of the modes, you add the uh, take the energy in mode one and energy in mode two, energy in mode three. You uh, add them. Uh, that will not be the energy of the system. So there will be some interaction terms you have to account for, but to account for the balance. So that is the only that, that is the difficulty. So it, it's in some sense because of this problem, this is useless because the modes energy of the modes doesn't give the energy of the system. You have to account for the interaction terms. Okay, so, but otherwise you can do this. So next, yeah. This will uh, give us a uh, maximum amplification mm. and maximum energy to the. Uh, and the type of energy. excitation. So if you have uh, basis functions based on first mode, second mode, third mode, and all that, you will know how much to excite in each of them. So it, you you may not necessarily to get the maximum amplification, you may have to excite a combination of modes. But like, uh, is it like the, what is the initial condition you are talking? Yeah. Initially, the disturbance that you are giving to that. Yeah. So you let's say we have um, several eigen modes, okay, like like here. But this initial condition is uh, project. Let's say this is the projection of the initial condition on each of the eigen mode. So you can disturb the first eigen mode or the second eigen mode or third eigen mode or hundredth eigen mode, or you can disturb a combination of all these eigen modes. So you put the energy distributed into different eigen modes and Optimum initial condition means, uh, optimum direction means, in which manner you distribute uh, the energy into. A certain distribution will uh, give the optimum initial condition. So this is the eigenvector decomposition. You can do eigenvector decomposition, or you can do uh, uh, like a orthogonal basis, which is very convenient. That's why I used orthogonal basis. I used the uh, natural modes of the duct, so that's convenient actually. Any other question? Repeated eigenvalues also you can construct solution. Yeah, okay. That is in your course, we generally say it will follow a high entropy path and also generally can we say something here, like just following some high? Uh, no, thought, okay. I, I have no idea. First you have to define an entropy based on this. I think people who do um, statistical mechanics, they construct theory for crystals and all that, phone on vibrations and all that. So could in principle do that, but we have there is no such theory as of now, I have not done it. So we can use the concept of pseudo spectra for studying normal systems. So before that what is spectra? Uh, spectra is a set of all eigenvalues and how do you get eigenvalue? If A is the operator and lambda is the eigenvalue, what is lambda? When you say a minus lambda is 0 or you can say a minus lambda i inverse goes like infinity or something like that. So uh, 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 z is a epsilon pseudo eigenvalue of a if it satisfies z i minus a inverse is greater than epsilon power minus 1 or we can say z i minus a uh, is like less than epsilon all of these things. So that means you are not looking to satisfy the relation exactly, but we will put a small number and say okay, within this number you will, you will satisfy the relationship or uh, if you were looking at a resonance phenomena, your amplification goes like inverse of the distance between the forcing frequency and the resonance frequency right, so it is a 1 over uh, a distance kind of relationship and as you approach the resonance you get infinite amplification. But here instead of getting infinite amplification we are looking at uh, large amplification 
So, epsilon is 0 and then this becomes Eigen value and this inverse gives the amplification, but instead you say epsilon is a small number that is epsilon inverse is 10 or 100 or 10,000 these values depend on the system itself what is large and what is small. So, you can actually have large amplifications even if you are far away from the Eigen value for non normal systems and then we can take a look at that with the pseudo Eigen value. So, uh, the way to compute is to have the set of all points on the complex plane whose minimum value of singular value of z i minus a is less than epsilon, but you need not worry about how to do the calculation, uh, but let us look at the concept. So, if you uh, take an operator and look at the pseudo spectra, first you can look at the spectra. So, you calculate the Eigen values and these dots here are the Eigen values. Now, you say you do not satisfy this. Um, a minus z i is 0 we do not do that, but a minus z i is less than some epsilon and you draw take this epsilon contours and then you can actually calculate the contours for z and those are these contours. So, the Eigen values themselves can be on the left half plane let us say uh, for the evolution operator, but the pseudo Eigen values can spill to the right half plane. So, there is another way to look at it uh, I, I first said you can think of exciting a system with a frequency and as you come close to the resonance you get large amplification, but if you are having pseudo resonance you may have large amplification away also. For example, whatever value you have here for epsilon you are getting here also everywhere also. Uh, now, uh, we think of um, let us go back here this operator A, now, we do not know A exactly or let us say A is perturbed a little bit. We have a, we have electrical heater in our experiment and let us say the heater power changes slightly or something. So, the evolution operator can change or the velocity mean velocity can change slightly or anything. So, you do not know or you do not have the exact a, but you have some a is perturbed and you look for the Eigen values of that perturbed matrix that is another way of interpreting pseudo spectra. So, the crux of the matter is if this pseudo Eigen value crosses to the right side then there is a possibility of transient growth. So, uh, contour should protrude to the right half plane for the system to exhibit transient growth and uh, this is like a necessary condition for transient growth and you can use this concept of pseudo spectra and we can get bounds on the uh, uh, transient growth and so on, but I would not go into too much detail. So, uh, if you look at the evolution of this e power l t. Uh, for a non normal system, uh, you have a growth and decay, and the uh, decay is determined by the eigenvalues, which is what is called spectral lapses. Are. And uh, this peak is determined by how much the pseudo spectra protrudes to the other side, and this initial slope is determined by the numerical lapses, because the eigenvalue of uh, minus L plus L transpose over 2. This you must have studied in maths. I will derive it otherwise. Glasses, one second. So, I am following Farrell here. this is I am using his notation uh, just to so that you can read the paper yourself. So, this is like the inner product of the state vector with itself and this is like at some time t divided by uh, inner product at some time uh, 0. So, this is like the norm 2 norm square of the 2 norm and uh, this we can rewrite this as e power a t u naught we know that is the solution. Now, we can use the definition of adjoint
so we have to look at e power a dagger plus a t so it, it this depends on uh, this quantity so uh, Strictly speak, right? I so this is what kind of matrix is this? This is a symmetric matrix, so we should be able to look at its eigenvalues and tell what is the uh, whether it is growing or not. So, um, this thing's eigenvalue uh, actually. Uh, a plus a, a transpose divided by 2 that is eigenvalue is called uh, numerical abscissa uh, and that will determine how much is the initial growth and then how, how far it grows determines on the uh, uh, pseudo spectral axis uh, how much it protrudes to the other side and um, the decay asymptotic decay is determined by the eigenvalues or the spectral abscissa uh, okay that is written here. Yeah, so you we saw this equation. What is this? This is our uh, energy corollary in the presence of heat release given by Lord Rayleigh. And uh, predicting transient growth using Rayleigh criteria requires the precise knowledge of initial conditions. And uh, see, ambiguity of initial conditions due to noise because you cannot precisely know the initial conditions. Make the uh, identification of transient growth using Rayleigh criteria very difficult. There is one more problem uh, you see this triangular brackets. So, normally we try to average over a cycle to find out uh, whether energy in this cycle is less or more than the energy in the next cycle. But when you have transients we, we saw the everything is changing. So, we cannot really identify pinpoint a period because there are many periods available. So, what is the period itself is a question. So, we cannot really uh, use this to make any uh, study of uh, transient growth. But you can look at the operator everything we did the G max or the pseudo spectral abscissa and, and so on they and the um, condition that the pseudo spectra should protrude to the right side etcetera. They just depend on the evolution operator and they are actually giving the maximum possible growth. So, we are not able to pinpoint and study for this initial condition this is the growth for that of course, you, have, you can do the evolution and get it. But this G max is like a upper bound that is the maximum transient growth you can receive for any initial condition together. But that just does not depend on initial condition because it is maximized over all initial condition it just depends on the evolution operator ok is this clear. So, let us look at some experimental stuff um, to see if all this is really there or a fantasy. So, this is a uh, you, you can see this is data taken from Louisville it is a friend of mine a colleague experimental investigation of limit cycle oscillation in unstable gas turbine combustor this is a real turbulent combustor actually you see a lot of noise here and then suddenly it takes off. So, in reality it is not like a system is completely sitting silent and then bang on initial condition happens and then. So, you have noise and noise means all kind of possible states are there. So, eventually you hit some right initial condition because any initial condition is like we think ok this is some time t this is the values and then how we progress. So, noise can act as like it, it, it does the same purpose as initial condition and so. Uh, and what he has written although large amplitude disturbances are generally required to initiate unstable oscillations in non-linearly unstable systems a systems may be non-linearly unstable at low amplitude disturbances that are the order of background noise level this scenario is somewhat analogous to the hydrodynamic instability in a laminar Poiseuille flow. This book was published in 2005 before we came up with this theory of non-normality, but uh, what he has written is he is talking about low amplitude disturbances. So, generally triggering was perceived to be caused by high amplitude disturbances, but the people who did experiments noticed that you can see it at low amplitude disturbances. Now, in hydrodynamic stability this 
revolution happened in 90s and uh, I think 90s, late 80s perhaps it started, 90s the battles happened in 2000 maybe, the people won the battle. So there the non-linear terms are energy conserving, that means all the growth is because of linear mechanism, non-linear terms just redistribute the energy between the modes. Uh, but in thermoacoustics our terms are not linear or non-linear, they are not energy conserving because you see it adds energy P prime Q prime. So we do not have this situation, so we can actually get triggering without transient growth also by large amplitude excitation with only one mode analysis. But because of the interaction between the modes or the non-normality and the non-orthogonality eigen of the eigenvectors, you can get uh, transient growth starting from small amplitude disturbances and then with the small amplitude disturbances can actually take the system to a, uh, another state limit cycle. So that is this somewhat, but I asked him, he said uh, he did not know really why he wrote the word somewhat, but it sounds perfect now. I met him recently two months back and I asked him, did you really knew what happened? He said, I had no idea. Uh, I just wrote this and it turned out to be working. So I showed you the hysteresis. Now you see the same pattern, you can see this experimental data from MATB 2003. This thesis can be downloaded from internet, very nice thesis. And it is, so you come here, you have to come to 1050 watts to go up and you have to go back to 650 watts to come down. So if you, if I just draw a line in between, this is very similar to the bifurcation plot I drew. There were this, uh, this is the threshold amplitude over which you have to cross. So this is the uh, unstable limit cycles are lying somewhere here, right? And, uh, and this is the uh, stable limit cycle, the green, okay? So what we, our theory, you can make any theory if we, and all theories are wrong because you always make lot of assumptions, but can you explain something? So is there any use to your theory? That is the idea, okay? So that means it has to uh, match the or it has to predict something which are, some things which are observed experimentally. So, so that was in a re tube. We see it in a pre-mixed flame also. You push the flame and it becomes unstable in own way, but when you come back, you, uh, you, you, you come like this and the flame becomes unstable here at, at that particular location of the position of the burner. And to come back, you cannot just come back right here and become uh, uh, stable, you have to go a little bit further to make it stable. So this is in a diffusion flame, uh, this is a pre-mixed flame. So again, uh, you have to uh, come here to go unstable, but you have to go back at another place to become stable. So hysteresis is the order of, I mean th there is a lot of uh, hysteresis to be seen in any kind of experiment. Uh, so two of them are our experiments on this in the uh, somebody else's experiment. Now this is the uh, our experiment where unfortunately the audio is not playing. Uh, this is like a noisy system, the noise stays it is as it is, but some other time the noise suddenly goes to instability. In fact, uh, if you do the experiment running with uh, at, uh, different levels of noise, for example this level of noise. Uh, here for example, if you had certain level of noise, you do the experiment 100 times, 70 times it triggers, 30 times it does not. So now you talk about some kind of probability <coughs> because noise is stochastic, so you can only talk about probability terms. I will not speak too much about this. Uh, just want to show one last thing. So we construct our phase space, okay. You can use all the vectors, you can construct the phase space or there are uh, techniques with which you can construct reduced order model. So there is something called Tacken's embedding theorem and you, if you have time series data from that you can construct the phase space and so on. I do not want to uh, discuss any of this, but uh, in this phase space, this is our stable fixed point and this is my stable periodic solution which is also called limit cycle. Now the issue is how we are going from which is the easiest way you can or, or the, which is the smallest energy will, which will take you to the limit cycle, that is uh, uh, that's the uh, question here. And this is from uh, Matthew Juniper from Cambridge University, is my friend, uh, done some follow up on our work. So every point in the state space is either attracted to the stable fixed point or the stable periodic solution which is limit cycle. So although we say instability, the limit cycle is a stable solution actually, it's just that the oscillations, we do not like it, so we say that is unstable. But in reality, the limit cycle 
is a stable periodic solution is not it the stable limit cycle. So, some points uh, some points go down here some points go up here ok. Now, there is really a basin boundary which is uh, which separates uh, the, the two uh, two basins of attraction and there is a basin boundary which separates this basins of attraction ok. So, uh, the a surface separates points that evolve to a stable fixed point uh, from the points that evolve to a uh, stable limit cycle. So, there, there is this possibility and there is actually you can actually find the unstable periodic solution on this basin boundary that means the solution, but you cannot stay there because any slightest departure will take it out of it. So, in principle there is a solution, but you cannot have it there it is not stable. So, if you have any questions please ask me. So, we want to find the lowest energy point on this boundary ok that is the idea. So, you have a boundary and the question is whether the boundary is like a football everything round or is it distorted uh, from this picture you can imagine that I am hinting at a distorted. So, uh, let us say you you have this limit cycle and let us say this is the lowest energy point in the unstable periodic solution. Do you have to hit the system with at least that much energy or can this dimple be dimple such that you can even have lower energy and still go up to the limit cycle that is the question. So, we look at different topologies this is a cartoon given by juniper the different types of potatoes. So, see this is uh, it does does not have any grooves inside, but here already you can see there are some grooves where if the unstable limit cycle is lying on this topology you could still be inside this pit and you can have low energy you can have this kind of potato also the topologies can be quite complicated. So, the optimum initial condition actually grows transiently towards a unstable limit cycle. So, it first starts from some low energy point comes goes to a lim unstable limit cycle just loops around it for some time because it cannot really stay there. Now, unstable limit cycle will have several attractors which are attracting to the limit cycle, but there will be one neutral direction along the eigen along the limit cycle and one will be kicking it away. So, eventually it will try to float around here, but then suddenly it will just take off it will be have a slingshot and it will go towards the uh, unstable limit cycle. So, you can uh, uh, read about this <coughs> by reading this article in journal of fluid mechanics by uh, M P juniper Matthew juniper triggering in horizontal decay tube non normality and transient growth and bypass transition in journal of fluid mechanics very nice paper and they have used uh, calculations <laughs> using our recative model with that Heckel's correlation and so on and use the same solution and try to look at the nonlinear dynamics. You have any questions? Sorry? Unstable limit cycle. Ah. Can you explain what is the difference? Yeah. So, let us say um, this is amplitude and this is heat of power. Um, not putting any units, but so let us say you come till here, uh, you are increasing the heat of power at some point you you get to instability. Okay. So, the so, these are stable fixed points that means, you can be here and I am coming this way, but the system is still staying there ok. Here also there is a solution in fact, in our Riki tube first we let us look at what is stable versus what is unstable. So, you can have the Riki tube just have the base flow that is a solution to equations right is not it. If there are no perturbation your solution will be satisfied trivially satisfied if u prime p prime q prime everything is 0 will not your equations be satisfied it will be, but you cannot have a solution here once the heater power is jacked up. So, there are solutions, but I have put hollow circles that means uh, these are unstable ok 
six points and these are stable fixed points. Now, I come here and I have solution that means, even if I disturb the solution um, it will come back to that. So, if I say this is some kind of curve this is the limit cycle what it traces. So, I uh, I uh, push it to any of the points inside the envelope. So, and, and you look at points starting from within this gray area how they evolve eventually they will all so after some time converge to this. So, that is like it is a stable limit cycle you can push it, but it will come back, but let us have another, another scenario where I have um, I have another case now I have a point and I push it instead of con converging it is actually diverging away. So, there is a solution that is possible, but it cannot stay there or only time it can stay is in principle at minus infinity or something which I mean real time you cannot stay there. So, there is a solution it can be satisfied, but you cannot find it. So, that is an unstable solution and you cannot find it because it cannot stay there because any perturbation will be taking the system away from that. So, in this case for example, you can imagine there will be these unstable limit cycles somewhere here. Suppose in the system I am just taking the gas and not the heater uh, like uh, heater power taken in the gas from by the gas is plotted here. Ah. So, in that case once it goes to unstable uh, mode it will take in more power mode because the amplitude of uh, vibrations here are high. Hmm. So, uh, from heater ah. the power absorbed into the gas will be much more in the unstable mode than in the stable. Yeah, so, so like uh, the heat you are talking about uh, excessive heat transfer from the yeah, yeah. So mean mean energy is taken more yeah, yeah that is right because of streaming and so on. So, like uh, is that the reason why this hysteresis comes because then you have to do a lot more energy to take it back. No, hysteresis this means that uh, uh, once you are here hmm. and you are going back so I should stand this up. once you are here and you are going this way you are already outside the basin of attraction. So, you cannot find this point here it will just instead stay here. So, you see you have this unstable basin boundary separating these two solutions and it depends on whether you are inside the boundary or outside the boundary. So, if you are going this way you are always inside the boundary. So, you will fall back here, but if you are coming this way you are already at such loud amplitude. So, you cannot go back here because you are already outside. So, it is being attracted there. If we escape through the lower energy right. part of the basin, yeah. but there is a possibility that you can you do not need to reduce that, that much energy to get into the basin, you can end up through some other point. Right. So, so it depends on like direction. What that will be uh, that uh, will that affect the hysteresis of the No, this is the uh, this diagram only indicates the final state or the asymptotic state, it does not talk about what happens at the initial thing. So, just it is a plot of solutions, but in this plot here of this phase space yeah you can actually if you have a large energy, but you are inside here then you can fall back to the basin boundary, but if you are already on this limit cycle you are already on this limit cycle right and you change some parameters. So, you will get a different limit cycle which will be very close to this limit cycle. So, just slide to that rather than come in. Yeah. Should we should we take uh, the heater power taken by the gas rather than the heater power we are giving? Yeah, that is okay. See, we are, we are unable to measure it. So, okay. so in, in this case, in the theoretical calculation, that is the they are the same. In the experimental people, they cannot measure the heat amount of heat taken by the gas. So they will is put. That the same in the, 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 the experimental because 
electricity in experimental you can only measure the current and voltage and all those things uh, and electrical power if there is a way to measure the power taken by the gas so there will be some losses and uh, in the cable some amount will be lost by radiation and all that so if you can account for all that and measure yeah it is possible but uh, in, in theory both are same so in theory in the correlation what we used to see taken by the gas but an experimentalist cannot quite measure it I mean it is in principle possible but very expensive you need to use some laser induced fluorescence or something I, I, I mean I would not even dream of doing this thing. So, it is much simpler to plot input power. So, in a dynamical systems you can plot anything you want as the bifurcation parameter as long as it affects the system that is the good thing about that machinery. Any other question? Okay, so we will stop here. We'll